People very often ask me both how and why I started my podcasting journey. Well, as an engineer, I'm frankly very passionate about math. I wanted to find somewhere to share stories of great mathematicians from Archimedes to Alan Turing and everyone in between. And for that reason, I want to tell you a little bit about the, my preferred hosting platform, which is Zencaster. Now, before I continue, this is usually the conversation I have with anybody who is wanting to start their own podcast. I know there are so many people out there with passions that they want to share with the world or unique knowledge that they're just looking for a platform to start with. And uh, Zencaster is a wonderful all-in-one platform. What I mean by that is you can do your recording and your editing and use AI to create a transcript uh, and, and uh, distribute to all platforms, including Apple Podcasts or Spotify or anywhere else where podcasts are played. For anybody like me who might worry at first about what you might sound like on an audio recording, Zencaster's post-production process makes you sound really, really smooth. It automatically removes any of the ums or ahs in your recording. It removes any of the awkward pauses in conversations, and it also helps you to set the right podcast loudness and levels while reducing any background noise all with the click of a button. It couldn't be easier. Go to Zencaster.com forward slash pricing and use my code breaking math and you'll get 30% off your first month in any Zencaster paid plan. I want you to have the same easy experience I do for all my podcasting and content needs. It's time to share your story. America, we are endowed by our creator with certain unalienable rights, life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. At Grand Canyon University, we believe in equal opportunity, and the American dream starts with purpose. To serve others in ways that promote human flourishing and create a ripple effect of transformation for generations to come, find your purpose at Grand Canyon University. Private. Christian. Affordable. Visit gcu.edu. All episodes of the Breaking Math Podcast are available commercial-free on Patreon, starting at our $5 per month tier. Visit us at patreon.com forward slash breaking math and sign up today. Welcome back to another episode of the Breaking Math Podcast, the show where we explore the history of mathematics and how it's used to build models and further our understanding of the world around us, all through telling stories that are accessible to everyone. I'm your host, Gabriel Hesch, and today we're exploring the use of a tool called an interactive theorem prover, a tool used traditionally to assist humans with creating rigorous math proofs. But we explore how this tool might be used in other areas, such as creating models in physics and chemistry, as well as other fields, all which can be described mathematically. In this episode, titled Interactive Theorem Provers Used to Model Physics and Chemistry, we'll be joined by the industrious Autumn Fano of Cosmo Labs, a company that's been instrumental in helping us tailor our content for a broader audience. Autumn brings her expertise in industrial engineering and a passion for making complex concepts relatable. The episode uh, springs from a thought-provoking dialogue that the Breaking Math team has had with the editors of an open-source journal called Digital Discovery. They are an open-source journal that emphasizes data-driven research at the nexus of computer modeling, including AI and other tools, uh, chemistry, material science, and biotechnology. And while we love diving into the machine learning um, topics and, and its potential... Today, we venture back to our mathematical roots to address some of the gentle pushbacks from our community about our venture into machine learning and wondering when we'd return to discussing our more traditional math-related topics. We'll be discussing the transformative role of interactive theorem provers in science. Think of them as meticulous tools guiding us toward a more rigorous and faster scientific breakthroughs, uh, sometimes with the help of AI and sometimes just with the help of the uh, theorem provers themselves. We're imagining a future where tools like the Lean Theorem Prover not only enhance our understanding of math and philosophy and science, but also streamline the way we approach research in the scientific community in physics and, in physics and chemistry and other related fields. Stay tuned as we unpack the, uh, how the theorem provers can prove check our way to innovation, reduce errors, and democratize science for a broader range of researchers. We'll look at how, it, how it integrating lean theorem provers with machine learning and neural networks could propel us into a new era of discovery and examine the importance of formal verification in ensuring the reliability and trustworthiness of scientific knowledge. So without further ado, let's embark on this thrilling journey into the potential challenges um, as well as opportunities with using interactive lean theorem provers to shape the future of science.
Before I continue, I want to mention something that I'm very, very excited about. Uh, I have had some secret help here on the Breaking Math Podcast. A few months ago, uh, I had reached out on the app known as X, formerly known as Twitter, and I asked if anybody knew of anyone who, who was good at marketing, who could help with the social media aspect of a podcast about math. And I was recommended to a company called Cosmo Labs. Um, you can find them on Twitter. They are a social media consultant company, also a media consultant company. They've worked with uh, many, many platforms, uh, magazines. They've worked with cryptocurrency. They've worked with all sorts of things, and uh, they, they 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 came strongly re- recommended. Well, I was talking to the CEO of the company. Her name is Autumn Faneff. And uh, I come to find out that she actually has both her undergraduate and her graduate degrees in industrial engineering. And she has a very robust background in chemistry and material science and absolutely loves talking about the technical details of physics and chemistry and loves talking about math. So we've actually had many conversations about the Breaking Math podcast. She uh, helped me to design a new logo. She's responsible for the uh, black and white logo that you currently see. And she's also been very, very instrumental in uh, how I write a lot of the um, podcasts and how I summarize a lot of the uh, concepts in math and physics and I make it accessible to you all. So I want to read to you a little bit about her bio. Autumn Faneff is an applied mathematician and industrial engineer who has worked in the fields of mathematics, biomedical engineering, blockchain, mechanical engineering, and polymer physics. After leaving academia, she has led many projects in the tech, blockchain, publishing, and gaming industries. She was named one of Startup Boston's 2022-2023 movers and shakers in the crypto and blockchain space for her inclusivity and pragmatic applications in tech and worked as part of a team at The Femme magazine. Since co-founding Cosmo Labs in 2021, she has worked as COO, helping people from all over the world work, um, with publications, podcasts, and individuals for marketing with a special focus on making accessible content and authenticity for influencers, artists, academics, and businesses. Now, on top of all that, Autumn has been working a lot with myself behind the scenes on the Breaking Math podcast uh, with the start of the new seasons and for future episodes. I couldn't be more thrilled to introduce you all to Autumn Faneff. Autumn, how are you doing? I'm doing well. Thank you for having me. And it's been a blast working with you the past few months. (laughs) Thank you. I, I couldn't agree more. I, I couldn't agree more. I've been thoroughly impressed with your ability to synthesize very high level information and make it as accessible as possible. I think that's something that I need a lot of uh, work on myself when I just look at my old episodes. I, I stay really stuck in the headspace, you know, of like academia. And I, I, I think I struggle with bringing it down to the layman sometimes, you know, I think you're very, very good at that. Very good at that. In fact, so I, I, I admire that skill and I hope to learn more about how to to do that. Thank you. Um, like essentially when I you try to do a podcast or I'm working with any publications, you have to think about your audience first and foremost, right? So yeah. the way that I look at it is I taught several courses with like 150 freshmen, their 18 year olds, bright eyed, bushy tail, biomedical engineering, right? So you've got this group of students who are like, oh my gosh, like I want to learn more stuff. And uh, I've taken that same enthusiasm from bringing it in the classroom and I want to make it just the same level of accessibility, um, essentially for anybody who listens on the podcast. Um, I I like just to have that because we take that (laughs) high level knowledge that we get in these papers and then I, I just love ripping and tearing these things apart. And it's like, okay, but what is it really telling us as a science communicator? And that has so much add value to the average listener, not just the academics uh, that, you know, will have episodes that may cater to it. But I want to make sure that everybody can have really good information that's accessible. So that. That's what I have loved doing, whether it's been working in tech or blockchain or just anything whatsoever. It's how do you pitch that story to whatever audience that you have? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, 
Yeah. I'm sorry. I, I keep interrupting you. I, I apologize. I just keep enthusiastically saying, yeah, 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 on the background. In fact, <laughs> hopefully, like, this is what I, I hope to achieve here and do well for the audience in that respect. <laughs> definitely. Definitely. So I also, I'll mention a couple of things for our audience. Just a, a few things. You and I have talked at you know, hours and hours and hours, I think maybe seven hours of background talk per one hour of podcast content put out there. Uh, I want to mention a few things for our listeners. First of all, we have a brand new website. We, we have one up, but I'm still currently deciding on the best format. Uh, there's a lot we're doing with the website. Uh, the first thing that, we're, we're, we, that I, we've talked about doing that we haven't really done formally yet is have an open invitation for, for blogging. There's so many people out there who are passionate about math. Or, or, or science or, or STEM in general and want to blog in a community, you know, just for the general public. And I really want to make our platform one of those platforms. I don't even have a blog, a blog section. Uh, you know, I've, I've gotten lots of feedback from you, um, on the website and I appreciate your feedback, but one of the, we're getting there. We want, we're getting yeah, there. We're get, uh, yes. Yeah. We are. We are. We want to have a blog where we have contributors from. All you folks out there, there's plenty of you out there who want to be science communicators like what we're doing, and we want to build a community. Second thing, um, I, I've received a little bit of interesting pushback. I, I deep-dived into machine learning these last five, six episodes, maybe. Uh, it's been my new obsession because that's what I'm doing uh, where I work right now. I'm deep-diving into machine learning. And it's peripherally, it's related to philosophy, to neuroscience, to science in general, to human knowledge and math, but not just math, if that makes sense. The pushback I've received has been gentle, but it's been, hey, you used to be a math podcast, now you're what, science -y, uh, neuroscience? I think that's a valid feedback, but I also think that it's it's uh, worthwhile to talk about where we are and wh where we're going. Machine learning is part of it, but uh, today especially, we're going to talk about um, rigorous mathematical proofs, which I think is is as mathematical as it gets, and how that can be applied to other areas of science. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about machine learning today, but um, there, there's a, um, a blog out there. There's a YouTube video out there that does a map of mathematics. And we were talking about this before this episode. Do you recall the, the creator of that map of mathematics? It's Denise Gaskin's Let's Play Math. And she really goes into a map of mathematics and it talks about the different topics and structures within math. And it's a really, really, really awesome, uh, narration of yeah. all the different fields. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, and there's this beautiful, uh, you know, almost like a poster, and and it, it's divided in between um, applied math and pure math. Then each of those are broken up into all their subfields, going back for you know things that came out, uh, you know, in the ancient Mesopotamia and and ancient you know Egypt and Greece and uh, um, you know Babylon, and then like you know recent things like topology and and all, all these things. Anyways, with breaking math, I essentially this is another idea for another tab on my website. I want to have something that that borrows heavy inspiration from this math of, a map of mathematics, giving full credit to the originator. I want to extend it because I want to have clickable links on a map of mathematics where you click on the link and it, it goes more into detail about that topic. Maybe it'll have a link to an episode we've done on that topic. And it'll also uh, have more explanations for how it networks, how it relates to other topics. That's my grand vision. That's another thing that we want to do on a new website. And, and that keeps us grounded in our discussions about mathematics. And it also provides a map. You know, like if you buy a new video game, like a Zelda game, you get your map and you see what you've done and, and where you have to go. And it helps you to make sense of the big picture. That's something else that I want to do with the Breaking Math Podcast. Now, machine learning, I think it's fantastic. Machine learning is a worthy topic. I wanted to describe it mathematically, like what exactly is it doing? Because ultimately, it's all linear algebra. So I justify my foray into machine learning saying, folks, folks, even though I'm using these other terms here, like neural network, and it's all linear algebra. So I still stand by the original decision. But I wanted to let you guys know where we're going with breaking math, where we're going with this episode. And, uh, you know, also, I, I mentioned uh, right now I have Autumn joining me for seven years. I worked with Sophia Baca, and you guys know the news that she passed away this last year, and it's been very difficult. Um, I've been very, very much in touch with her family and her friends, and we are continuing the podcast in honor of her, and I'm doing my best to honor her 
you know, through this effort and openly talking about her and her contributions and how we can honor her uh, going forward. So, yeah, I hope to incorporate that uh, a lot um, in this episode and in, 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 future, in, in future episodes. Autumn, I know I've told you a lot about my work with Sophia and how we've collaborated in grad school yes. for the last seven years on this journey. So I, I'm honored to have you here, you know, on the team right now. And I'm glad that I can speak openly with you about and- Sophia's contributions. Big shoes for me to step up into as well. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Oh, for sure, for sure. Um, I'm going to put a lot... Uh, oh, that's another link that I'm going to put on the website as well, is Sophia's spectacular contributions. Sophia made a poster of tensor calculus, the, the kind that was used in Einstein's general relativity. I'm going to put that poster up. I have. I still have like 200 copies of the poster left over, which she used to sell. To be perfectly honest, I haven't decided what I'm going to do with them. I, I think... I, I, it, you know, if, if I were to sell them, if I were to, I'd like to donate the money to a cause that her family believes in. But I, I just don't know yet. I'm not. I, I haven't solved that yet. But I'm going to post the actual art on on the website because it's beautiful and people should appreciate it. That as well as some of the other memes that she created and all kinds of stuff. So. I uh, thank you for listening to this long foray of announcements. There's a lot to talk about with the mission of this show, where we've been, where we're going, and we've got a very, very exciting paper to talk about today. So, whoo, there was a lot there. Um, I Autumn did a spectacular job of summarizing a, uh, pa- a paper that I think was over 15 pages. You summarized it beautifully, and I would like to give you the floor so you can uh, share your summary with us. Thank you. Um, one little thing that I do want to add in is about our crossover episode for Digital Discovery with Breaking Math Podcast. So Digital Discovery Journal is an open access, gold open access journal that publishes both theoretical and experimental research at the intersection of chemistry, material science, and biotechnology. It's published by the Royal Society of Chemistry. Here at Breaking Math, we love using the foundational building blocks of mathematics that build up other areas of science, and we break down the rigorous details so you, the listeners, can take a deep dive into the new fields and expand your knowledge. This episode, we delve into AI and machine learning influence in chemistry with the paper that for with the paper Formalizing Chemical Physics Using the Lean Theorem Prover by Bobbins et al. So today, we are essentially going to combine all of our knowledge with basic physics and chemistry, and then imagine writing scientific theories in a way that not only humans can understand, but computers can too. This paper really explores the very idea of proposing interactive theorem provers as a tool to ensure the accuracy of scientific theories, while also making them machine-readable. Think of these theorem provers as meticulous computer programs that act like expert proofreaders. Unlike typical software that blindly manipulate equations, they break down proofs step-by-step, verifying each individual step for logical correctness. This rigor makes them more reliable than conventional computer algebra systems, which can sometimes introduce errors. So when we're talking about conventional computer algebra systems, think of MATLAB, Python, Mathematica, in which we are actually defining each variable And, you know, the way that I would say it, instead of just proving it, we just, we just wing it and tell it as the baseline for the definition. So in contrast, theorem provers have essentially proven their worth in advanced mathematics and their, their, their application in chemistry remains relatively unexplored. and. In this case, we are bridging the gap by demonstrating how these powerful tools can be used to formalize and rigorously check the validity of chemical theories. 
You know, real quick, and if I may, one of the things that I think you and I talked about, uh, the, the analogy of the game operation. I think that's yes. a very good analogy here. Yeah. Think about it. Think about it. As you're playing operation, you're, you move very, very carefully and you make one wrong move. You know, it, 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 it buzzes and it tells you right away. Automated theorem provers are, I'm sorry, not automated theorem provers, interactive theorem provers are similar to that. I said that, I said that correctly, right? Interactive theorem provers. It's yes. Yeah. Okay. Very good. 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 Making sure I didn't make, Make a mistake there. IDPs, essentially. Yes. IDPs. Yeah. There do exist automated theorem provers that are, that are attempt to have a computer do all of the work, but we're not talking about that. An interactive theorem prover is, is a guiding tool where the, the human still creates the proof and goes step by step. But, but the cool thing is if a term is not defined, it'll buzz, it'll say, nope, that term isn't defined. Or if the step you're making doesn't logically flow from the previous steps, like perfectly by definition, it, it'll buzz you. It, it almost seems annoying. Annoying, but that's a new, very good thing. It keeps you accountable to your own logic, and it does so perfectly well. So, I don't know. I, I, in, in mathematics, it, it's a very, very useful tool to help. Uh, you know, you, you don't have to use a human, uh, an, an, another human who, if they're tired and they're having, you know, human error, th- they'll miss things. These computer programs won't do that. Precisely. So it's essentially taking it. And turning it into a proof, right? So yeah. the, it essentially lies in translating your often informal language of scientific theories into precise computer friendly format. This is the way that mathematics and science is actually turning, especially if you are an applied mathematician. Um, it, it's becoming more of a building block if you want to expand in any way, shape, or form. So we introduce concepts like variables and types and the big one here, proofs, that step through practical examples from the field of chemistry, just like a mathematician. So the authors showcase how to derive the Langmuir adsorption model, which is a key concept in surface chemistry using an interactive theorem prover. They further demonstrate how to define functions and utilize them to prove properties of mathematical objects within the model. So beyond the basic examples, the paper really ventures into more complex territory, exploring the use of the geometric series to formalize the derivation of the BET equations, another cornerstone of surface science. It also touches upon advanced techniques like structures to define the intricate relationships within the chemical theories. So by presenting these practical applications, the paper aims not only to convince chemists of the value of the interactive theorem provers, but also provides a roadmap for incorporating these tools into their research practices. Ultimately, the approach holds the potential to revolutionize the way that scientific theories are formulated and verified, leading to a future where scientific discoveries are built on a foundation of rock-solid mathematical certainty. Yeah. And real quick, for a minute, I want to highlight a couple of limitations uh, with this approach. Um, luckily, uh, or right, thankfully, I was able to chat with a couple of the authors before we had this episode. Uh, one of them was Professor Tyler Josephson, uh, and he spoke with me at length about this approach, about uh, you know how it, it's a painstakingly meticulous approach, but it's it, it, it's still a very very useful approach. Uh, but it still it has its limitations. So uh, I'll go ahead and highlight a few things he said in our discussion from his email, and I'm mostly quoting directly from what he said. <clears throat> He says, at this stage, I wouldn't say that we have accelerated science or modeling. Lean lean is harder for scientists and engineers to learn than other programming languages like Python or MATLAB or Mathematica. And writing proofs in Lean also requires knowledge about proofs. And most people who get a degree in engineering, uh, they'll, they'll do algebra, calculus, statistics, but they don't really focus on logic or proofs unless they're getting a math minor. Now, He's creating a curriculum to close this gap for engineers who want to explore modeling and lean. Uh, he has a uh, um, a uh, a camp. I, I, I call it a camp, like a like, like like a deep dive boot camp, so to speak. It's an RU. <laughs> Reason RU experience right. Experience for undergrads. Okay, there you go. There you go. Yeah. Also a course. <laughs> 
<laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. It's called yeah. Th- thank you. It's called Lean for Scientists and, and and Engineers. It's coming in summer 2024. And he says, please feel free to join online or in person in Maryland. Now I will have his contact information in the link show notes. We have his email and he's very responsive and very passionate about this topic. And I'm sure he'd be happy to answer any questions that you might have. Now, regarding this paper that we're talking about, for those of you who are interested, it's important to know that this paper is written in Lean 3, which is now deprecated for Lean 4. Now, unfortunately, there's some compatibility issues between those two versions. Lean 4 is the future and it's here to stay. So read the paper for the vision that the actual proofs shown are not going to compile in Lean 4. However, the team is working very hard to translate all of them, but they may not be all available by the time you listen to this episode and follow up reading the paper. Uh, So what is Lean 4? It's so much cooler than Lean 3. It's not just an interactive theorem prover. It's a fully functioning programming language. Their next step is to connect these derivations into executable code so that they can write scientific computing software that doesn't have any bugs. Thank you for that. Time for that aside, and uh, I'll give it back to you, Autumn. Now, we have to look at a few things that are really big picture here, and we kind of have, we extrapolated a lot of different things from this paper and the implications of which are going to probably just bounce off for like the next few generations, right? Not only as chemists, not only as mathematicians, not only as physicists, but science and engineering as a whole. So imagine that we're going to have a future where scientific theories stand on unshakable foundation of rigorous machine verifiable proofs. So this vision explored in the paper is advocating for the use of interactive theorem provers, so ITPs, for short, uh, to revolutionize how we really write and verify our scientific knowledge. So let, let's talk about some of these themes. So first and foremost, we have the power of formation or formal verification. So ITPs act as a meticulous century, eliminating human error and hidden assumptions. So the proofs become mathematically airtight preventing errors that have plagued scientific discourse for centuries. So this is going to pave a way for a new era of confidence in scientific findings, minimizing uh, minimizing controversies rooted in flawed derivations. So human error, it just gets rid of that. Now, we have to look at the language of precision. Uh, Scientific language, while powerful, often harbors ambiguities. Formal verification forces the explicit definition of mathematical objects and functions, shining a light on potential inconsistencies and fostering clear communication across disciplines. Imagine where scientists can seamlessly collaborate knowing that they're operating on the exact same solid ground for precise definitions. Now, that really does change a lot of things for the building blocks of discovery. And if we have our formally verified proofs, think of them as Lego bricks for science. They're going to be modular and reusable, and they enable scientists to rapidly construct new theories and investigations, accelerating the pace of knowledge acquisition. Now, think of this as some complex scientific evidence not with having shaky assumptions, but with robust pre-verified components. How is that going to rapidly change things for building any sort of chemical or physics foundations, right? Or anything in engineering? What is that going to change for us in the future? Now, If we're looking at some of the challenges that we're going to experience here, we have to look at transforming these informal proofs that we have into the formal language of ITPs, demanding time and experience. And that right now does potentially slow down research compared to traditional methods, just as 
Learning a new language takes effort, so does mastering the art of formal verification. As any mathematician knows, you know, you got to work on a proof, you got to make sure it's correct, and that you have verified results over time. So that also bridges the reality gap with formal verification guaranteeing logical correctness. But, you know, we're people. This is not magic here. The real world remains complex, and the proofs don't automatically translate to perfect real world accuracy. Science or scientists still must rigorously validate theories against experimental data, ensuring their beautiful equations hold weight in the messy labs. So think about this. You're moving across country. You have results as a scientist in one location on the East Coast. You move all the way to the West Coast. What is going wrong with your experiment? This is going to help you with validity checks and what could potentially be happening with your results. The, yeah, the paper even mentions that. Like they have a section on what they call the BET theory of adsorptions with multiple layers. And they say that, that they, they establish a logically consistent model using the uh, lean theorem prover. However, the model is incorrect in the sense that uh, it doesn't map to what uh, scientists experience with adsorption, you know, in reality. So again, these proof checkers check for consistency, but, but, but we're not yet, uh, um, uh, it's not necessarily accurate to reality. That doesn't mean it's not useful. It just means that the theorem provers are not at a point where where, where they can model everything that we observe in uh, reality. So, um, gosh, um, yeah, it, it just it, it, it's worth understanding that that it's it, it's it's for um, what am I say here? It's it, it's for consistent logic more so than correctness. Exactly, but at, at some point, you know, you're going to be able to have these additional variables that come in over time. So I'm assuming um, that could change your results for things. So that that is something that can be probably added in under certain temperature, pressure, whatever inconsistencies. And maybe it even puts a big question mark on what went awry for your results. You don't know how this is going to pulled out in the real world. Yeah, absolutely. And also, as I say, just because, you know, it, it's consistent logic, even if not correct now, it doesn't mean it won't someday be. So long as the universe and the, the phenomena that we observe in it are describable mathematically, it is possible, even though it's in theory, it is possible to describe everything using this methods, even if we're not there yet. And yes, it will be, you know, a long way down that road. Nonetheless, you know, uh, progress is being made with lean theorem provers to get there. Precisely. So we think about that. It's ensuring that reliability for AI-generated proofs and other hurdles that we're going to overcome. <laughs> yeah. So with that, it also is going to give us that glimpse into the future. You know, you think about the advances that we're going to have even in the next three to five years, maybe the next decade or two, right? Yes. So. We're building these out as libraries of knowledge, and these are going to be filled with formally verified proofs across diverse scientific disciplines. It wouldn't just be an archive, but think of it as your treasure trove of reusable knowledge that empowers researchers to stand on their shoulders or on the shoulders of giants to reach new heights of understanding. And we get to use AI as a scientific partner um, that helps us understand and manipulate formal proofs that can revolutionize our scientific exploration. So imagine AI automatically formalizing our informal theories and suggesting new novel conjectures uh, that can create new complex proofs for us. Think of it as like you're the scientist, you're the superhero, and AI is going to be your sidekick. <laughs> it is going to help you accelerate that discovery and push the boundaries of your knowledge. You know, as you're mentioning AI, AI is actually uh, uh, 
mentioned throughout the paper, including machine learning. And they specifically talk about uh, that there's some efforts where a, uh, a theorem prover is used or integrated into the reward function of a neural network, like a large language model or something else that models some something in physics or chemistry or material science. And I think that one problem that's recognized with machine learning right now is it's it's a tendency to hallucinate. For example, chat GPT or other large language models will say things that are simply not true or or uh, image uh, generation can create images that are completely fabricated. And with a lean theorem prover uh, that is part of the reward function, um, it, it has the potential to both be creative and to lay out proofs, but also be verified and checked by the theorem prover and be a lot more useful. The paper doesn't really go into a lot of detail into the success or failure of this approach, but it, but it does indicate that this approach is, is being um, worked on. And I, for one very much look forward to seeing the intersection between uh, machine learning, whether it's large language models or something else that models things in physics or or chemistry, and how they work with uh, lean theorem provers to uh, further advance our knowledge in science and engineering and, you know, make better models. So like what the way that I'm kind of picturing this with chemistry and physics, I would say this is like an 80% generalization. Think of this as the tools in your toolbox that you already have and you can create. I wouldn't really want to consider the uh, hallucination aspect for the AI, right? So I would just say, hey, this is, remember in like elementary school mathematics, that little black box function, what is X? Yeah. Oh, yeah. (laughs) Input output machine that you would have. Yes. Yes. I I think of the tool that they're building essentially as something like this. You have all of these little components that you have on your, like, uh, uh, on the conveyor belt going into the black box. What is going to give you for the desired results? Right. So I, I wouldn't put that the advancement of hallucination in there yet. Okay. You know what? I see what you're saying because not every, not all neural nets are generative models. What I'm talking about is, ex- yep. well, right now is exclusively a generative model. I think the reason why it, I went there in my head, and you probably saw this as well, is because large language models could be a, a, a part of creating a proof. And I associated large language models with generative models that do have the tendency to hallucinate. But what you're talking about, very, very, very valid, is, um, Fu- uh, machine learning as a function approximator, which it also is when you're, it's not even, we're not even talking about a generative model per se. So you are, uh, you're absolutely correct on that. So uh, I'm thinking at the moment where this is starting at is just our basic building blocks. <laughs> okay. Yeah. So, you know, at, after time, like these are going to be actually built off of proofs, mathematical proofs, which give us boundaries and limitations in which AI has those set boundaries and, you know, it it can come up with, Hey, this is an error, right? Um, Yes. You're going to have to be able to close that gap for whether it's going to be, you know, just something that, that was like, Oh, Hey, this, this came up with some weird result. Please check this. Right. Or, Think of it as like a formal verification process in which we're going to have all these theories that are going to be continuously refined by the real world. And, you know, that that helps us remain grounded in reality and ensure scientific understanding. Instead of running that process in the lab 500 times, you have all of these papers that verify these results. whether it's in the uh, Journal of Failed Science Experiments or something that's published in whether it's like Scientific American, right? Um, yeah. th- this, is, this is stuff that's going to be like, hey, we've done this so many times. This is the same result. And if you run that and then you add one more experiment, hmm, this gets to be really interesting, right? <laughs> And yeah. you're pulling off of a few more steps. And then you say, okay, if I can run this model that's done all this, and I have three or four experiments that I want to see, what's this going to 
give me as a result, whether it's a new material or something else. Um, and you get to see how that just kind of goes on in the future, <laughs> right? Mm -hmm. Yes, so yes. You get the computational time, essentially, done for you. And then you can say, eh, error, you're not going to have a good yield. Or error, um, it's too cold to do this experiment. Mm -hmm. It takes off probably 80% of the work. And then you can go in as a scientist and say, yay, this thing works. Or no, it doesn't. And sometimes you're going to still question that validity if you don't like that result. And that's when you go in and say, hey, these are my actual results for the yield for this product, for this process. Um, and then let's test it. Very good. And I think that that's, that's our reality gap is do we waste time on this? Yeah. No, I got you. I got you. So, okay. yeah, <laughs> which, which kind of gives us that big impact in the end for how is this going to impact humanity as a whole, right? Yes. So, there's few things that we have to look at it's unwavering trust innovation that's going to be sped up and then accessibility right so yes. if you're going to have unwavering trust uh science programs what is going to be this new gold standard for scientific knowledge we've written stuff in books for years copy pasted and just had all of this public trust and confidence in the scientific progress, right? So we're going to have a world which changes everything from politics and science, and now it's going to be shifting that scientific validity from questioning proper logic to focusing on real-world implications. <laughs> Yes. So that that's huge. Yeah, yeah. Now, look at the innovation of this, right? You streamline your processes of formulating and testing hypotheses, and then leading to a rapid acceleration of scientific breakthroughs and technological advancements. Now, we've just gone through a global pandemic. And imagine if that new vaccine was developed in maybe days, maybe even a month, instead of six months to a year. Yep. And that can also be something that changes if we were going to Mars. And what's the material properties that we have on Earth? And what's the difference between that on Mars? Or any new planet, or even colonizing on the moon. I'm just throwing anything out there, right? Yeah, absolutely. What happened if we wanted to have a whole civilization underwater? <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. Right? Yeah. So, the other big thing that we're going to have is accessibility for everyone and science for all. So, if a program like this has user-friendly interfaces and automation, you can simply lower the barrier for entry for formal verification, and that democratizes science. Yep. And it also empowers a wider range of researchers to contribute to the pursuit of knowledge. And, you know, science isn't limited to ivory towers in academia it's accessible for anybody who wants to be a scientist some of the smartest people in the room do not have degrees and that really changes the playing field on how people become inclusive and have curious minds you know Everybody's going to bring up the, oh, but what happens if the science is bad? Yeah. Oh, I think that that 
is going to be some big question that we have in the future, right? For anything that we do, AI, machine learning, anything of that sort. But, you know, that essentially it brings this paper just summarizes the thrilling journey of like having formally verified science and with continued research and collaboration, we can really unlock the true potential of ITPs laying foundation for a future where scientific understanding is more rigorous, discoveries are faster, and the benefits of science research for humanity as a whole. So only time will tell what happens. Yeah, yeah. It's exciting. And I think we talked about this as well, but like this process, you know, the, the, the formal, uh, proving process is, is, uh, iterative. Or I shouldn't say iterative. It's, you have to do one thing at a time and you contribute to the field slowly. But as the libraries build in the, you know, with, with the lean interactive theorem prover, as it builds, the mathematical library called MathLib is expanding more and more every single day. Well, I shouldn't say every single day. It's expanding as people contribute to it more. And those tools then become accessible for others to use. Everything, you know, being built on this kernel of only 6,000 lines of code that have all of the axioms that are the kind of a priori a priori knowledge it's being built you know that that library is continuously being expanded so even though it's gosh i think it's fair to use the word uh you know cumbersome i uh you know i I suppose it's rigorous and the capabilities. So, you know, the capabilities are always increasing and I love how the authors invite everyone to take part in this process and help add to these, you know, math libraries, or in this case, maybe chemistry or physics libraries of, of things in, uh, in this language. And, you know, you know, for use as a modeling tool. We also briefly talked about in my interviews, if this could be possibly used in philosophy or in law, for example, and they said, oh yeah, absolutely. In fact, it has been used in philosophy um, before. Um, I think somebody did one of the proofs of God, I think, you know, from the, um, is it, oh gosh, what was it? It was the one that that talked about, you know, uh, a God that exists is better than a God that doesn't exist, or rather God is the most perfect of all beings. A God that exists is better than a God that doesn't exist. It was some set of proofs where they were able to um, axiomatize it, and is that is that the right word? That's yes. It. Okay, and then and then they actually laid it out using the Lean Theorem Prover. So I thought that was pretty cool. So yeah, there's a lot of work to be done, but it's exciting and it's it's really cool to be part of this rigorous practice. Um, codifying human knowledge. So, yeah. I also I'll mention real quick. We were given plenty of resources by Professor um Tyler Josephson, uh, who is the professor at um University of ba- of Maryland Baltimore, and he is the one who is doing the um the summer program. I'm sorry. What's the name of the, of the summer program? It's a uh, uh, research experience for undergrads. He has an REU currently going on and he will be looking for students for the summer along with uh, having a new course for summer of 2024 mm-hmm. um, yeah. being for scientists and engineers is going to be free to join online or in person in Maryland. Yeah, a few of the resources as well. In fact, in our show notes, we're going to have a few articles from uh, Quanta Magazine. Quanta has recently covered a, a lot of stories in the lean theory improving community, and they are a fabulous resource for those who want to get an idea of, of what this community is all about. Also, there is a recommended textbook and resource on GitHub for introducing Lean Theorem Proving for Beginners from Professor Heather Macbeth at Fordham University. I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly. There's even a Lean Theorem video game. Um, there is a, it's called the Natural Numbers Game, where you start in a world without math and you unlock tactics and collect theorems until you can beat a boss level and prove that 2 plus 2 equals four to go further. We'll have the link to that as well and some other YouTubes on this subject as well. Finally, as I said earlier, if you're an undergrad STEM student and you want to spend a summer in Maryland, make sure to contact Professor Josephson and find out about opportunities at his university. And that's all for this episode. Thank you so much for for joining us. We have got a lot of content to cover in the future. I want to get more into machine learning uh, and how it's it's being used with um, theorem provers. And um, gosh, lots lots to say. Any closing plugs before we end the um, episode? 
also, I have a little teaser for folks who are interested in board games and game theory. Uh, I will be doing a few episodes in the future on that. So just stay tuned because I have a lot of really cool things coming your way. (laughs) All right. It'll be really exciting. You'll hear a lot more from Autumn. We'll have a new exciting website up with our math tree. Should we call it that? Something inspired by the map of mathematics that'll be clickable and interactive. So that's coming soon. So thank you for joining us. I've been Gabe and this is the Breaking Math Podcast. Get everything you need for your next project today at Menards and save big money. LP Smart Side products are the number one brand of engineered wood siding. Smart Side trim and siding offers long lasting performance and delivers the warmth and beauty of traditional wood. Save big money today at Menards and LP Smart Side products. Plus, visit Menards.com to view the weekly flyer and check out all of our great deals happening this week. Save